Hey guys, welcome to the episode of the Planeswalkers Pub, the show that's 100% right 90% of the time. I'm your host, Aaron. I'm Eric, and I don't <laughs> think that math was right. <laughs> that was totally right. Howdy, it's RJ. Today, we are going to be talking about keepable hands for Commander. But first, let's talk about our signature card. Every episode of the Planeswalkers Pub will feature a signature card that may or may not relate to the episode's topic, and today's card actually does. Oh yeah, shit, it really does. I did not plan that. (laughs) Today's signature card is Thought Cutter Agent. Thought Cutter Agent costs a blue and a black. It's an artifact creature, human rogue. It's a 1-1 that says pay a blue and a black, tap it, target player loses one life, and reveals his or her hand. So this card's dope. To kind of cut off Eric before he says anything, one damage means nothing in Commander, which is true. However... Showing your opponents your entire hand, that means a lot in Commander. This card is decent, but I wish the activated cost was too generic rather than Demir. I don't know. I mean, I feel like because he's going to go straight into like a Demir deck, so you'll have both the colors. It does make tapping more interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying the required Demir cost is a restriction. True. But Actually, you can also run things like Chromatic Lantern fixes your mana. You don't have to really worry about colors anymore. Or even just like a um, like the Signet. This way you've only got the one open. Or you can have like three open or something in that sense and have the Signet and be like, okay, I'm threatening anything. Cool. The end of your turn, I want to see your hand. And the cool thing about this is unlike one of those cards that actually looks directly at your opponent's hand, they reveal their hands. So they physically put the cards on the table. This way everyone else can see them. So you might not even use it to get your own value. You could just be like, someone's like, like oh, well, I'm threatening maybe something. It's like, well, let's see what you're threatening. <laughs> Show us your hand. They're threatening nothing. They've got like four lands and like a soul ring. Nice job, bro. You're threatening nothing. Yeah, no, this card really does take away any threat. It or not? Well, let's rephrase that. That takes away any guessing. Guessing. You know what your opponent's going to throw at you. You know if their threat is real or not. You know what they can do yeah or even better i like this as a political tool because i'm also one of the person that what i did find this card mainly looking for other cards because i like telepathy so much telepathy is a single blue enchantment each opponent reveals their hand and plays with their hand revealed like it's just one of those cards that kind of screws up things and there's no more lying there's no more sneakiness you just kind of show us your hand um, I like this as a political tool because it could be like, oh, well, if two people are fighting, let's say, like, you know, Eric's arguing with, um, like, you know, RJ, like, hey, you should totally not do this because Aaron's going to do this or Aaron's going to do that. I'm just like, well, let's see what's in your hand that you're saying is you're not as scary. Let's see. It's just like, oh, cool. Life from the Loam, Gitrog, and Bajukabov. Nice. Why is Gitrog in my hand if he's my commander? Because I bounced it back because fuck Gitrog. Oh, yeah. <laughs> No to the frog. Well, I definitely know a commander that could use this. Uh, send triplets. Nice. I was, I was about to say that too. Yeah. Because they want to be able to cast things from your opponent's hand. The ability to see what's in them. You might not pick the, that person. Like, okay, let's pick RJ. It's like, wait, he doesn't have any big creatures. So let's just switch over and pick someone else. Oh, no. Even before that, what you do is on the end step before your turn, you pick somebody and you look at their hand. Yeah. And then you can see, ooh, do I want this person or should I pick someone else before your turn even happens? Yeah. And even still, Send Triplets is on an upkeep trigger. So you can be like, okay, in response to that trigger, like let's say you looked at Arj's hand at the end step. I'll look at Eric's hand this turn. Okay, Eric doesn't have anything either. I'll just choose the third person. Like let's just choose C's hand because I haven't seen that one yet. So that can you be kind of cool too. You haven't seen that hand yet? Moving on. This card's good. Um, <laughs> little niche, but it has its ups and downs. Um, overall, though, unless you're doing uh, sand triplets, I'd probably honestly play telepathy over this if you want this type of effect in your deck. Yeah, because telepathy is permanent. It's also an enchantment, so it's hard to get rid of. It's it's a permanent thing you don't have to actually pay mana into, which is kind of nice. Moving on to our main topic, talking about the types of opening hands you should keep and throw away. Now, when we're talking about opening hands, we're referring to the commander formats, um, because obviously that changes things compared to standard or legacy or something like that. But before we talk about opening hands, we have to first talk about the mulligan rules in commander. So the official by the rules committee mulligan rules are this. 
You draw your first opening seven cards. If you like them, you keep them, no one worse. If you don't like them, you then shuffle them back into your library and then draw seven cards. In Commander, you get what we call a free mulligan, which means you automatically go back up to seven. There's no penalties or anything in that sense. That second mulligan, if you like it, keep it. If not, then you shuffle those back in. Now, once again, going to the official ruling, at that point, you then start doing the London mulligan, which is you draw seven cards, look at them. If you like that hand, you put one of those onto the bottom of the actual library itself, and then you start the game like normal. However, in a lot of playgroups, we'll give like two or three free mulligans because it's a commander. No one cares. Yeah. Commander games are hour-long affairs, and it is no fun seeing someone have what I personally call a no-game hand, which means you basically do nothing throughout most of the entire game. Don't have enough lands to cast anything, and more often than not, you're discarding down to seven almost every turn. These games are not fun to play as or play against. So we were generally uh, pretty generous when it comes to Mulligan. Yeah. Now, granted, each playgroup, for the most part, is different when it comes to how they want to justify a free Mulligan versus Knots. In the rules, you always get a free one, and then everyone after that, you should be London Mulliganing. I know in our particular playgroup, we'll say, like, hey, you can have basically three free ones. Basically two it's or three. It's basically three, but I think we pretty much don't care and do as many as you want. But if you do too often you're pretty suspicious and are digging for the god hand. A true Lord of Chaos keeps the first hand no matter what it is. And a person Dad, actually- RJ, I thought you were gonna say something important. I've been meaning to say that for like 20 minutes. <laughs> My main theory is if you are in the type of playgroup that we are, where Mulligan, let's say like two or three times for free, after that, stop. Whatever hand you got, keep it. Because at that point you're digging for something. A like, type of Mulligan I like is, uh, draw seven, and then if you don't like them, uh, put them face down, draw seven more. Because constantly piling the cards into your deck, shuffling them, and drawing them again can result in drawing some of the same cards you just shuffled away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But anyway, how this relates back to our topic in that the amount of mulligans you have can relate to what you keep and what you put back. Because you have to weigh the options of okay, if I mulligan this away, I'll have to go down to six or five. Is that worth keeping a hand like this? Yeah. Whereas if you have unlimited mulligans, you can kind of take advantage of that and go for a better hand than you normally would have. One thing I kind of want to mention is my basic ruling when it comes to a hand in general. Keep a hand that has lands and spells. And oh, really, Aaron? <laughs> lands and spells. Let me finish my statement. Oh, <laughs> So, if you can cast everything in your hand, or at the very least, mostly everything in your hand with the lands that you currently have without drawing another land for three turns, that's a decent hand to keep. That's not only a decent hand to keep, that's amazing. Or even if you, like, you know, if you've got, let's say, a land or a hand that you can get up to cultivate, that actually works too because you're digging for more lands. Yes, but you need to balance between. Ramp and gas. Here's a situation. If you were playing Azori Renegade Leader as your commander, and you opened up with three forests, a soul ring, a land war elves, cultivate and Kodama's Reach, would you keep that hand? I heard land war elves, so yeah. What uh what are the lands? Any lands? Three forests. You're playing mono green. Yeah, that's fine. Because you got you can go forest and land war elves. And then turn two, you've got like two more mana's, drop that. So that's like three three mana on turn two. Yeah, because you can go like, because Azori is three? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, that's totally fine. So I'd be call that, call me crazy, but I think that's actually an incredible hand because that's three lands, two more from Cultivate, two more from Kodama's Reach. That's seven cards out of your library that you don't want to be drawing anymore. Mm. That's a, almost a tenth of your deck right there. Yeah. You guys surprise me because. To me, that's a terrible hand because it's all ramp, no gas. Once you've got those, all those lands, you've got almost no cards in your hand. What do you do with that? I mean, you have Lanwar Elves and an Azori, and you could probably get a pump effect off him, but 
that's only two creatures. Well, let's actually use another example. Um, so I actually put my commander decks on the table here. Um, I've shuffled them, but like, you know, a Altogether. standard shuffle. There's <laughs> currently one giant stack of cards. <laughs> no. So I pulled from SRAM. Let's read the commander real quick. So SRAM Senior Artificer, it's one of white. I was about to say one of blue. One of the white for a legendary dwarf, 2-2. Two, two. Whenever you cast an aura, equipment, or vehicle spell, draw a card. Simple, easy. It's a Voltron deck. It's really cool. I love it. And this is kind of the five that I, or the seven I actually just pulled. Three planes, a reliquary tower, black blade reforged, a trailblazer's boots, and it that be trace. So the question is, would you keep this hand? Me personally, yes. This is perfect. If I don't draw any lands for, let's say, three turns or whatever, I've got four already on my opening hand, so I'm good. SRAM automatically draws you cards. Typically, it would go planes, uh, like double planes or whatever. On turn two, you get out SRAM just like you want to. And then you can turn three, play the Black Blade, draw a card. Turn four, play the Trailblazer's Boots, draw a card. You can't necessarily get up to eight that betrays, but the point is you can play out basically everything in your entire hand, and you're good to go. With SRAM, whenever I give SRAM to someone, I'm just like, hey, be sure to cast them on turn two. That's basically my main philosophy behind it. Uh, Eric, what did you grab? Well, first I'm questioning why if that betrays is in your SRAM deck. But aside from that... You put a sword of feast of him, if that betrays, you're having a good time. That's what I'm telling you. I'm just telling you. <laughs> okay, but I mean, you mainly want to kill people with Voltron damage. Save yeah, it, that true. betrays for... A better deck that can use it. Anyway, I have uh, Hakros the Unscarred. Double red, double white. 6-1. From the new Theros set. He has to attack each turn if able. When he enters the battlefield, you roll a dice. And he has protection from 2, 3, or 4. And once again, he has to attack each turn if able, which is really shitty. Yes. I opened up with three lands. Two mountains and a plains. And I opened up with... Three CMC three cards and one CMC five card. So turn one, play. Well, the first question is, would you keep that hand? Probably not. Uh, the cards that I have uh, are double devotion white and only one white. So I'd probably throw this back because I can't cast most of the cards in my hand, let alone getting to my commander. But here's the thing. With your commander, it is double double red, double white. You already have the double red, so all you're doing is just to draw the other white. And mm -hmm. then you're able to cast him. Yes, but casting the commander is all well and good, but if I only have the mana cast him and not anything else, well, once you get the that's double, pointless. Once you get the second white, then you're able to cast everything else in your entire hand. Because you just said the fact that um, the other cards in your hand, they're what, three CMC? Yes. So, you, so basically, you've got three turns. You're not going to cast anything turn one, two anyway. For instance, uh, flip over the top three cards. Let's take a let's take a quick theory. One, two, three. Ooh, oh. look at that! Right, There's so, that plane. So I see. Return to dust is the first one you're drawing. It's fine. You're gonna go plane. You're gonna go land. Go anyway. Second one is a pump spell, and then the third the third land or the third one is that planes. So that is a capable hand for this particular commander. Yes, but only if you had the foresight to know. That you're getting the planes on that third turn. What if you didn't? Well, That's the th you won't know for sure at all what you're going to draw. There's always the chance that you draw nothing but lands for the next ten turns because RN Jesus decided you're not drawing anything today. So if you know your deck and you know, hey, if I have these three lands and I'm likely to draw another land and you know you can keep it, then you can keep it. Here's a good thing. So Feather is what? White, white, red? Yes. Would you keep that hand if it was Feather? Like I said, you just need the other planes. That's it. Then you can cast Feather. Well, this is also only going if you're talking about just the lands in your hand. True. Because Feather is a completely different deck. Feather is everything's at, Your highest mana curve is probably like... Or let's say your, your average spell costs one or two mana, right? Yeah. So having three lands, perfect. But this one, he doesn't really know the CMC of this deck. Yeah, to be honest, because it's Aaron's. Decks, but yeah. um, but it's Aaron knows his deck, so <laughs> he jank. knows that hey, I can keep this hand because I'll get the right number of lands. So it really, it's the knowledge of the deck also decides whether or not you want to keep a hand or not. True. Um, so RJ, you actually grabbed the Locust guy, and I think you mulliganed. 
Uh, so what uh, was your first hand? No, I didn't mulligan. I just wanted to show the example of how luck can be. Oh. The first hand consisted of Fossa's Oracle, a Ponder, a Whirlpool Warrior, a Mystic Remora, noticing a theme, an Arcane Denial, a gorgeous Biden of Fossa. I want to steal this from you, Aaron. <laughs> and a Gilded Lotus. So no lands. No lands. And but, then, but wait for it. Wait for it. I did a test. I looked at the next top card of the library until I got a land. It was seven turns later, I drew a land. It was a reliquary tower. So you couldn't even cast it. And then two turns after that, there's an island. All right. So this is a prime example of just how RNG kind of works. I know a lot of people will think, okay, well, you've got, you know, the Mystic Memoir. You've got the Ponder that are a single blue pip that you can actually like, you know, play out if you get that island. However, throw this hand back. As much, There's no excuse to keep this. I don't think any commander ever wants this. The Hogak deck I had where I would just constantly, like, my first turn would always be I play nothing, discard down to hand, or discard to hand size. I throw a dredge card away and immediately start dredging. Well, yeah, but once again, like, a... Then again, I would keep a hands with lands in it. Yeah, because so you, you need to be able to play something. Like, that's the thing. You would, you, because even Hogak needs to be convoked out. He can't just be straight dredged out. Oh, sure. Sometimes people do cute things like, oh, I have brawn in an opening hand. I'm not gonna. Or, like, you know, just, or, um, or love, anger. Or even worse, like, you know, you have, like, a uh, re reanimate in your opening hand. Or yeah. Just like, cool, I'll discard this giant demon. And then next turn, I'll reanimate out the demon. What's good? Have you ever reanimated a Jin Kataxis turn two? Because I have, and it is the best. You are the actual worst. <laughs> um, so here's a decently weird hand that I probably would keep. I don't know. Let's put it up to the judges. So the deck that I actually chose was uh, Torbrand. Uh, it's one triple red. That's important, especially in this freaking deck. Um, if a source would deal damage to an opponent, if a red source would deal damage to an opponent or a permanent that opponent controls, uh, deals that much damage plus two. So the opening hand I got was Circle of Flames, uh, which is one in red, Sulfuric Vortex, which is one red, red, Pyroblast, Empowered Auto Generator. It's a weird four mana thing that generates a lot of fucking land or mana. Um, and those are the Punisher, which is also one red, red. And then I got two mountains. I would probably keep this. Thoughts? Should we test out our NGs? And see, because as of right now, I can see you can cast one. Well, that's the thing. I can. Hand. You can. You got the power blast to stop any little things that might show up early or whatever. You've got the circle of protection or circle of fire. To, uh, it deals one damage to a creature when it uh, attacks um, you. So that's before blocks. So it can basically kill little things that might be attacking you or whatever. And if I draw an additional land, I can go right into Zozu or the Sulfuric Vortex. So the very next card is Perforos. After that is Jaya Ballard, which is five mana. After that is Gutter Snipe into the mountain. So one, two, three. So turn four, I'm getting... So I'm just missing one land drop, and then it basically turns on my entire hand. But... Yeah, but before that, you're not casting much, so you're probably discarding some of those cards. Yeah. Well, someone one of your rules about keeping a hand... So if you can you cast, can cast most, of the stuff in it. Yeah. most of the stuff in it, yeah. See, here's also the downside, which is why I like doing this, because it shows just how much that I love to mulligan. Even though I have that rule of being able to actually cast the things that are inside your actual hand itself, you always get that theory in your head of, if I can just draw that one more land, it turns on my entire hand, it's really, really good. Um, in an actual game of Commander, not using this as an example, I would probably keep this hand. I would probably keep that hand. That's giving in to that instinct of, ooh, if I get another thing. You also got to realize when that instinct is wrong. Sometimes you you say, ooh, I need that one more land, but then you draw seven cards like I just did with Locust God and nothing. Um, Eric, uh, rip off the top from Imar. <laughs> just, just tear the deck in half. Don't tear the deck in half. <laughs> you said rip off the top. We got an excellent hand, boys. Nothing but lands. Yeah, but we got Protein Hulk, so... Oh, shoot. Oh, my God. That actually is not a bet. 
Oh. Okay, so we're making that sound because of what Eric just put down. So he put down, I see three planes. That's the three. Two forests. Uh, a, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, three planes, two forests, a soul ring, and then protein hulk. You're throwing that back. Really? Yes. Uh, yeah, I've because played that deck a couple times. Here's the thing about Amara. Yes, you always want to cast her. She is... Um, She's Celesnia, so green and a white. Whenever she becomes, she's a two-two. Whenever she becomes tapped for any reason, you create a one-one um, soldier with lifelink. So you always want to be able to tap her whenever, and you want to kind of be tapping her for other reasons other than just attacking. Yeah, that hand you throw back because there's, you're not doing anything. See, that's the downside. I feel like, or that's the thing you have to think about when mulliganing as well, and keeping your opening hand is the fact of. Am I not doing anything because I'm mana screwed, or am I not doing anything because I'm mana flooded? I feel like being flooded is better than being screwed because at least you'll have the mana to cast things. Uh, what was the next card? Was what another planes? Um, no, it's was regrowth. A, yeah, regrowth, which brings something back from the graveyard, which you're not going to put anything in the graveyard because nothing died. Yeah. I drew from Locust God again, and I feel like this is also a hand that you probably should throw. Although, I would keep this. All right, so Locust got again. Take two. <laughs> the Locusting. I got an Island, a Mountain, a Chaos Warp, a Keep Watch, which basically is draw a card. It's a two and a blue for an instant. Draw a card for each creature, for each attacking creature. It's very good with Locusts. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Perilous Research, which is one and a blue. Draw two cards and sacrifice a permanence. Serum Visions, which is a single blue. Draw a card, scry two. And then, or Frantic Search, which is two and a blue, draw two cards. I would keep this hand. I would 100% keep this hand. And the reason why I would keep this hand is because turn one, Serum Visions, you're drawing a card naturally. Next card you draw is Pact of Negation. That's interesting. Um, into Double Scry for two mountains. That's a lie. It's a Winds of Change in a mountain. So yeah, I would keep this. This is an easy keep. And this is one of those examples where technically you can't cast everything in your hand, but because of the card selection you can get, because of the natural card draw you can get, with, especially with the Locust God, it's a, you can keep more riskier hands because of it. When we get into the commanders changing the decks, we can kind of the rules are going to change yes. for how you would keep a hand or not. Right now, we're really just going over, hey, does this have lands? Can it cast what's there? Yeah. So we, we talk about throwing uh, hands back. Yeah. Uh... What makes you throw them back? Well, one of the things I'd say is the mana curve. In case you don't know, the mana curve is the highest concentration of cards of a certain converted mana cost in your deck. Most decks hover around the 3 or 4 range, meaning most of the cards in your 100 card deck will have an average cost of 3 or 4 converted mana cost. The theory is once you've hit three or four lands, you can cast the vast majority of the cards in your deck. This can obviously vary from deck to deck. So, as you said, the mana curve is a big deal when it comes to when you would throw back a hand. Say you're playing Feather, who is very much, I'd say the average CMC is going to be two. That hand, you could probably keep a... You'd want to keep a three-land hand to get your commander out, but you could keep a two-land hand and theoretically still be able to play the deck. Because then you could use that two-mana to ramp or things of the sort. I mean, the thing about converted mana cost is that, um, or the average CMC for the most part, is that it does go... It's a scale, basically. It's kind of on screen right now. It looks like, basically like a roller coaster, where you want to keep kind of like, you know... The low drops, like, you know, one, two, three drops are kind of a lot higher. And a then, bell curve. Yeah. And then as you get higher up on the CMC, like, you know, five drops, six drops, eight drops, you want to go lower and lower and lower, basically have none to existence. The opening hands, I always say, just to, they're immediate throwbacks. You don't even bother thinking about it. A hand has no lands, a hand that has only one land, or a hand that has 90% lands. So if you've got, like, yes. six lands and then something else, like, maybe it's, like, a six lands, like, I don't know. A sort of feast of famine. Throw the hand back. I don't care. It's six lands and a soul ring. Throw it back. Stop. If you have one land and a soul ring and then a bunch of other stuff that's not lands or ramp, throw it back. Like, there's... People will always deliberate, oh, but it's got a soul ring or it's got a piece of my combo or yada, yada, yada. If you've got no lands to cast it, you're not playing magic. 
Yeah, no, like, if getting a turn one soul ring doesn't facilitate getting your commander out on turn two, don't keep it, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, uh... Or if you can't do anything, the worst thing in the world is going turn one soul ring and then sitting there for three turns not doing anything else. You just have to adjust the soul ring on the field. Yeah. That's, I mean, you just Feather, wrong. Amara, neither of these commanders benefit from a turn one soul ring. Yeah. Because Carlos Man is not in their CMCs. Uh, the new Achilles. It's red, red, white, white. He doesn't. He can't use Soul Ring. There's no point. I mean, it's in my Feather deck, but oh, no, you know, it's in that deck. But you can't, you can't use it. Then throw it back. Um, it's also note to mention to just because you have a turn one Soul Ring, you also become an immediate target most of the time. Don't keep a Soul Ring since it's defining top land. Don't keep that. Even though you're thinking in your head, but I would so it's a divine time. I can look at the top three cards. I can find the lands. Now, throw it away. Are you speaking from personal experience, Aaron? A little bit, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> because you the theory goes in your head like, but if the lands are there. Here's my theory with that. And I know I'm going to sound like a humongous hypocrite because I also kept a bunch of hands I probably should have thrown away when we did the lower deck experiment. Assuming that it's there is going to fail you. Realistically, because you're always, you're always just assuming it could be there. What if it's? But if it's there, it's gonna be awesome. Realistically, it's not gonna be. Another uh, thing to kick back is if you're in uh, multiple colored decks, your uh, hand leans too heavily to one color. I've opened up with all mountains in my feather deck. Feels bad. <laughs> Especially when feather costs two white to cast. Yeah. Yeah. But here's a question. Let's say, going back to that example, if you have, like, you know, two mountains and a plains, would you keep that hand? I'd probably keep that. Because three land hands are hard to kick back. Because it's three lands. Like, yeah. It's like, I could do anything. Like, I could even be a boat. Like, right. it's it's really just hard to throw those back. I'm fine with keeping three land hands, typically. Because... Well, hang on. Three colored land hands oh yeah like, don't don't keep don't, the reliquary tower do and steel the citadel. dark steel, dark steel citadel. citadel unless you're playing an eldrazi deck yeah. now you mentioned beforehand um keeping a hand with all ramp but no gas what's our thoughts about keeping hands like that so for instance like you know you'll have i don't know that lanara elves into cultivate you've got lanara elves cultivate kadama's reach and far seek all in one hand so that's four cards in like three lands. Would you keep that one or throw it back? I'd probably throw it back, like I said earlier. I mean, I do like me some ramp and I do like me some elf bowl. But if I don't have any elves to bowl, all that mana is just going to do nothing for me. But You need some creatures to cast. You need some sorceries or instants, you know? Are you playing Omnath? If you're playing Omnath Locus of Rage and you draw that, that's a keeper right there. Because that's just, let me get Omnath now, and let me get more lands to then trigger his landfall. Get more angry boys. Yes, more angry boys. But realistically, no. You wouldn't keep that hand. Not even if you're like, in like Gitrog or uh, Lord Windgrace or something? Windgrace, no. Uh, well, Windgrace, yes. Gitrog, n- I, I would say no to a Gitrog hand like that. Because you want to discard. You would need to, um, doing that with Gitrog, you would need some way to destroy the lands to draw off them. Well, true, but it's like... Well, he does like, get... You do get rid of a land every turn with Gitrog. Yeah, that's true, but he has to stick for that to happen. True. And he's a 5 CMC boy. Wait, well, yeah, but you feel like... Yeah, he's 5 CMC, but you've got three bits of ramp immediately in your hand as well as the uh, Lanara Elves. So you're basically getting him out, like, turn three? Yeah, that's true. Um, plop him out, turn three, and then start destroying those lands and drawing into cards. That could work. Now we're going over to the last step. It's reset time again, which is going to be last call. Last call. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. All right. So at the last call, we mention a bunch of different things. First up is our newest subscribers. We are at like 93 or something crazy like that. So you guys are completely awesome. awesome. I love all of you. We love all of you. And we are really, really excited about what's coming down the pipeline. For instance, we started recording gameplay. Yay. Um, to see how trash we are. Don't worry about it. It's fine. It'll be fine. We also happened to pair with one of our friends. So Chris is actually one of our uh, main. You've heard his name before. Yes, we've mentioned him a couple of times. He is really 
helped us out a lot with the actual game with the actual gameplay for starters as well as just different items and theories on the actual channel itself so we decided to help him out and I want all of you guys actually to hop over to Twitch and subscribe to him. He is CM underscore three underscore. Link is going to be in the description box below. So links over to his actual Twitch itself. He's helped us out a lot. We've helped him. Uh, we're basically kind of doing this whole like joint partnership thing. He also streams MTG Arena. He's a lot better at Magic than us. So that's why we don't do it. Um, but we'll also probably start pairing around and streaming with him. I do also want to mention the fact that we have a Discord as well as a Twitter. We've created a decent, really cool community over there. We talk about a bunch of different stuff. Uh, one most notable thing about Discord is that we're going to start just putting in ideas and theories on like, you know, hey, this is the next episode. What's everyone think about it? As well as just questions, comments, things like that is the best way of actually contacting us and saying, hey, we want you guys to talk about this. Uh, Dragon Ball, I see you in the comments. Talk to us on Twitter or even our Discord. It makes it a lot easier for us to communicate with each other. Last but not least, I do want to mention our friends over at tcgplayer.com in the affiliate. In the description box below is our affiliate link that will link you over to TCG Player uh, by buying cards from them. You're only buying cards anyway. It helps the channel at the same time, so why not? Everything is cool and works out just the same. Thanks, guys, and we'll see you guys in the next episode. <laughs>